Okay, shall we start? No, I'll just introduce and maybe we can then begin. Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So today is the concluding session of the uh, lecture series on women's movement methodological perspectives. So as many of you know that we couldn't hold the third lecture and the third and the fourth lecture is combined today. So maybe we will have a little longish lecture at say till 4.30 or so, maybe the lecture would go on and then we can have a question answer session. One can write in the chat box and we can pick up the questions from there. So just to give up maybe a small background in case you have joined only in this session. Uh, well, we had uh, done something in the first lecture of something on colonial period, which is the 20th century. And there the archival material, as the Professor Hindu said, that the archival material is waiting for to be explored. In fact, there's so much of material that really one life is not enough to explore that material. And not only in national archives, but also state archives, they're waiting to be explored. In this period, though people, there's not, maybe people don't think that people are, women and really raise the issues. But there are many issues which, which were raised from many, many different points, standpoints. And uh, broadly, one would say that uh, issues regarding, regarding political, educational, and work related, and also concerning social cultural domain, were the, were the broad areas where the issues were raised. And the second lecture was mostly focused on the post-independence, and the section was divided into two broad categories. The one, the first section was something on constituent assembly debates and the first 25 years of independence. And the second section was on towards equality report and the processes in which the, the way the report was made. And uh, in the first uh, first section, though this was the era of euphoria and dreams, but it was hardly silent because women raised as into at individual capacity, women raised women's issues all for us, starting from constitution constituent debates, assembly debates, and also till UN. Towards equality report was based on widespread consultations, and that is why it could ascertain the real status of women in India at that time, and it, it painted a very grim picture of the status of women in India. And uh, unfortunately, it is even relevant today because the uh, picture, the, uh, the green picture hasn't changed much. So today's lecture would be around two sub themes. Uh, one of the third, uh, third theme, which was on engendering democracy issues and challenges. And the fourth sub theme, which was whatever happened to women's movement at the turn of the century, Indian women in the global world. So over to Professor Indu Agnihotri. Uh, thank you, Manjit. Uh, well, I'll, I'm going to try and race today because I'm trying to combine two different sessions and they were conceived of slightly differently. So if you find that there is at some point a lack of continuity between these two segments, please excuse me for this uh, problem that we encountered last week. Um, uh, Last week, of course, it was 2nd October and I had wanted to focus on a little bit on the Gandhian movement and his, Gandhi's role in vis-a-vis -vis women, women's participation in politics. Today, I'm not going to spend the time on that, except that I think there was one point which I wanted to make, which was, is a learning and a lesson as well as a critical issue with regard to the Gandhian movement. I, uh, in one of my first research papers in my life, in my own research life, way back in 1975, I had argued that for Gandhi, nonviolence was both a personal commitment, it was a belief, he believed in it, but it was also a political strategy. And I think it was that strategy was most effective vis-a-vis -vis his approach to women's participation in pol politics in the freedom struggle, because by opening up this space of uh, a political arena, which was aimed and where the objective was to keep it free from violence, he, I think, made gave an entry point for a very, very large section of women. And what strikes you is the mass scale on which women participated in the movements led by Gandhi. Now, I, uh, I as a student of history, I appreciate the strategy of nonviolence. And I think that holds. It holds that for any mass participation of move, um, any section of people, be it women or any other categories, 
um, there is a phase of any movement, social movement, where nonviolence plays a major role in legitimizing the movement, in legitimizing a political open arena and space. However, we all know that social conflict cannot always be uh, sort of capped uh, because the ruling classes, the state, do not always respond in a nonviolent manner and skirmishes happen, confrontations happen. So it is not a principle of uh, violence as a, as a strategy which may be upheld, that is not the purpose. But I think the biggest lesson from the Gandhian movement is that of uh, making uh, available and opening up a field of nonviolent mass scale movements. And I think the women's movement needs to learn even today. I think uh, the most positive experiences in the women's movement have been from big mobilizations around issues. As you can see today, I mean, even that day when I was going to speak, there was this issue in the background lurking. So Hathras was more alert and alive there as it is today. And I will come back to the issue that Hathras poses further. But it is a fact that in the 1980s, when we started again in the contemporary phase of the women's movement, which is the two sections that we are focusing on now, that is uh, post-emergency till more contemporary recent times, it is a phase where uh, there is big mobilization around the issue of women and with a consciousness of civil rights, civil liberties, uh, a consciousness that we have to stand for democracy. That was the biggest lesson that the emergency gave us. And people like me of my generation who were students during the emergency, that is the biggest lesson we learned from uh, those years that a the state shall always try to silence your voice and can take on more authoritarian measures or modes as well as modes of functioning but it is people's struggles which keep movements and democracy alive and in fact our engagement and entry into women's struggles was also initially through our involvement in the struggle to resist the authoritarian measures of the emergency. So the political movement, the civil rights, civil liberties movement, and the women's movement in the mid 70s, late 70s, had a direct linkage. They were organic linkages, and they need to be understood because that is still important. Um, the point, the documents which I wanted to speak about, uh, of course, for rape, there is no doubt that the open letter has been talked about as the most uh, visible um, uh, document uh, on the struggle against rape. You would have heard of the open letter by four academicians, that is Upendra Bakshi, Lotika Sarkar, Raghunath Kelkar, and Vasudha Dhagambar. All four of them wrote an open letter which was sent to the Chief Justice of India on the uh, whole judgment of the, what is called the Mathura rape case. Mathura was a minor and she was a tribal woman in, the, in Maharashtra who uh, uh, was raped in custody, in police custody. And the judgment sort of said she is habitual to intercourse. She's, uh, the, uh, this is with consent. And the uh, whole uh, issue that came up through the open letter and the public campaign against it raised very many questions, some of which come up again in, in every incident that we see of rape and sexual violence. Uh, and that was that, can you even talk about consent in custody? Uh, is there any scope for consent in custody? Also then the procedures and the judgments and this whole notion of uh, you know, forensic, the, those who are uh, even slightly familiar with the debates around uh, sexual assault evidence and forensic, this whole two finger test, etc. all these came up. Uh, so as well as the point that anyone who is convicted of rape, convicted, I'm saying, not accused, 
but convicted. And the women's movement, there was a debate. There was one argument which was placed that if there isn't a charge of rape and you are accused, you should not be allowed to uh, contest elections. And given the period of the emergency where all kinds of uh, methods were used to scuttle democracy, the uh, position that the women's movement took was that no, we should uh, say that if a person has been convicted of rape, then that person is not qualified to contest any elections. And I think that was a very mature position. Now, rape obviously is uh, an issue, and I will come back to it. But uh, actually, uh, since rape is constantly in the news, I will try to focus on another document, which I think has been sort of put aside in later years, which is very, very relevant. And that is what I call the anti-dowry charter of the Dahej Virodhi Chetna Manch. Now, dowry is an issue which we read about about C from colonial times. Uh, even in the peasant struggles of Telangana, etc., demands were raised against dowry. In more contempt, uh, uh, I already in my previous lecture, I had talked about how Renu Chakravarti and others had tried to bring in legislation uh, against dowry. And finally, the uh, what we call the D DPA, the Dowry Prohibition Act was passed in 1961. And um, we found that uh, till the 80s, when we, uh, late 70s, when we first started protesting against dowry, uh, hardly, I think not even nine convictions had taken place, if I remember, the, those were the kind of st uh, data and statistics we used to talk about. In the meantime, uh, there was a joint select committee of parliament which was set up on dowry and it gave its report. And from 1978, I remember the first demonstration that we had on dowry in Delhi. Uh, Hyderabad had seen a lot of uh, protest from the progressive organization of women prior to the emergency also, in fact, around dowry. Uh, and some of that is documented. People like Kalpana, the Sri Shakti Sangathan, etc., have written about those experiences. But in Delhi, because this, I mean, North India, in a sense, became a very visible site for conflict and uh, atrocity and murder around dow dowry. So from 1978, definitely we have documented evidence of what we call dowry deaths. And uh, we had protest. I remember the first protest we had in Delhi was in Jangpura. Jankura extension, where um, Urvashi's mother, actually, Urvashi Butalia and her mother, Subhadra, it was right next in their neighborhood where they were staying. And uh, this protest happened. Then, of course, closer to Delhi University. But this just continued. It continued with no, uh, I mean, no stemming. And in 1982, finally, uh, a platform was set up called the Dahej Virodi Chetna Manch. And for the next four years, four and, and more, what we find is that DVCM, as we call it, undertook a massive campaign, continuous, I mean, at all levels, from thousands and thousands of leafleteering, uh, slogan writing, uh, memoranda, protest, holding meetings with uh, students in the university um, community, mobilizing teachers, mobilizing workers. I remember we held gate meetings at the textile mills of Delhi when the shift used to change. We used to go be there at that time in markets and markets where dowry was actually being bought and sold. I remember holding meetings in Karol Bagh, Lajpat Nagar. These were big, big uh, street corner meetings, marketplace meetings, in Adatpur Mandi, for instance. I mean, then uh, even corporations like the Life Insurance Corporation, the Bharat Electronics, they set up subcommittees with women. What I'm talking about is a very, very wide mobilizational platform and continuous, uh, continuous engagement with the government. And uh, 1982, I remember on 3rd of August, we had this massive protest outside parliament. And 
there are two aspects to it one is the methods that were used uh, the organizational form this is uh, the beginning of what we see in delhi as a national organization platform a joint platform uh, vina mazumdar used to call it the seven sisters but sometimes it began with five the, uh, then there were seven then there were uh, some kept jo more joining and then they, these seven would mobilize others so it wasn't as if only these seven were participating in these protests um it started with uh, say if i want to mention the seven it was all india women's conference there was the national federation of indian women there was a uh, all india democratic women's association there was mahila dakshita samiti which in fact took the first initiative on the dowry uh, anti dowry platform under pramila danwate and vinal gore etc and um, um ywca and i think in the anti dowry uh, march for uh, 3rd august uh, 1982 there would have been you know trade unions everyone joined student organizations uh, a lot of the uh, groups that we see which are not which were not necessarily large large mass organizations all saheli stri sanghar sabla everyone joined so Uh, the uh, convening organizations were was this platform constituted of these seven organizations but um, and then uh, you know these protests and memorandum and then um, amendments which happened finally uh, you may note that uh, 1984 i think if i remember correctly it was the last day of indira gandhi's parliament uh that um, uh, this uh, no not a, uh, last day of her, when was it um that amendment was passed the dp amendment and then in 1986 again because that there were problems with that law and that amendment which we raised uh, continuously for the next two years uh, again through a campaign mode uh and 86 again a second amendment now why i'm talking about the anti dowry movement is it had concrete interventions as well as mobilization which resulted in an outcome which was seen in the legal domain very often when people write about the movement and they when they sort of there is a uh, an argument made that oh the women's movement took the legal path the point is that the legal path was not the only path uh, last time some people raised issues about was this liberal feminism what is radical feminism etc what i'm saying is when different organizations come in into a movement and when they sometimes work jointly despite differences i'm telling you even in the dahej virodhi chetna man there was difference of opinion of perspective some said we should have capital punishment they would raise the slogan bahu jalane wale ko phansi do many of us did not agree maybe with capital punishment many of us did not agree with the understanding of dowry but there was one common agreement that dowry must stop and the state should act to prevent dowry and that the condition on the status of the woman and the young woman who is to be married is both directly affected and you know that dowry is uh, and the demand for dowry as well as dowry that is affecting her entire life so we have to think of it in those longer terms and i can tell you from my experience of the 80s that this movement had a wide impact as a uh, as a university um, teacher i could see that impact on the minds of our students if you went anywhere it even though a bulk of this movement was taking place in delhi but there were other centers and similar protests started and i i have found that across india dowry grip the minds of young students particularly young women students not only that because we were seeing that even though for instance in islam there is no concept of dowry 
And yet, amongst Muslims, dowry was spreading. In the Northeast, communities reported how they used to, in fact, earlier have bride price, which was the practice even in places like Haryana in, historically in the 19th century, or in John Sarbawar as um, Joyati and all, uh, Joyati Gupta and all wrote uh, in their study. So increasingly, uh, other forms and of customs and practices were moving towards dowry and those communities, those castes, those social groups, uh, for instance, we would normally link it with upper caste and um, wealthy and landed groups, but here the manner in which dowry was spreading, it was uh, taking the poor in its stride, it was uh, leading to land mortgage and indebtedness, so the uh, impact of the dowry movement on young women's mind, uh, I can say in the 80s, and the interest it generated, it also generated a new form of interest in um, women's uh, rights and violence against women, apart from rape, which has already been discussed. Actually, the first document that I wanted to talk about was something very different, but uh, the dowry charter, I'll just quickly give you uh, some of the points from the dowry charter, which will tell you why it is important. The dowry charter said, make dowry a cognizable offense, which it was not till then. So if there's a dowry death happened, the, the police would not go and investigate because it was not declared and recognized as a cognizable offense. Now that was the change which came with the 84 amendment. Debar persons guilty of taking dowry from elective posts and public services. Um, compulsory registration of marriage with declaration of assets given to bride and groom. Sealing on marriage expenditure, uh, punish extortion and coercion in consideration of dowry uh, uh, in terms of marriage, recognition of stridhan of the woman, which is her gifts uh, at the time of marriage, um, of course, ostentatious expenditure, etc. But it was a comprehensive charter which talked about equal property rights for women under all prevailing laws, irrespective of the uh, personal laws across all these and compulsory share for daughters, um, exp um, special courts to be set up, uh, compulsory in registration and investigation of all unnatural deaths of young women married within the first seven to 10 years of marriage um, and post-mortem by two doctors. A constitution of area committees with police representation. Now, um, rehabilitation services, shelter homes, uh, monitoring media textbooks to uh, prevent glorification of dowry, and the establishment of a national commission for women. Now, what I'm saying is, if you look at it, what is the outcome? Today, for instance, you have 498A, which came up in 1983 as a direct result of this these campaigns and these pressures. You had the crimes against women cell set up in 93, 84, first time in Delhi, and then your Mahila Thanas. These also emerged from pressures built by these campaigns over a sustained period of time. You had the HSA, the Hindu Succession Act Amendment 2005, which comes after years and years, decades of mobilizing and awareness raising around the, so the whole issue of equal property rights. You have the civil act, which comes, the domestic violence act, which comes in 2005, after some 20 years of experience of the criminal law amendment, both in terms of um, the evidence act, the 498A, as well as the criminal breach of trust, under which the question of uh, you know how we've said that they are extorting, using dowry as an extortion, and then they throw the woman out. So the criminal breach of trust argument and clause of 405 IPC was used on that. Uh, the, uh, the shelter homes, today you have more than 700 one-stop centers across India. Uh, the idea is every district should have at least one. Um, this is also a direct result of the uh, demand raised in this charter. Uh, your media textbook, all that came in national education policy. And of course, you have a national commission for women. What I'm saying is, you know, 
in when we read about the women's movement we tend to treat these activities with some amount of you know we have an intellectual arrogance we are all scholars oh this street protest oh this the charter what does it mean this is some kind of view. but what i'm saying is that the movement has worked at several levels these documents matter they have paved the way for reforms amendments legal uh, discourse which has created a whole um, atmosphere where at least some issues have come up all may not be resolved but those issues have been incorporated over 20 30 years in practice in government agency functioning etc similarly the one of the first documents which came out from a joint activity at that time this national platform did not exist really but a joint activity um, was uh, the you know, what we call development imperatives in which CWDS and CWDS was part of DVCM as well as of course this development imperatives was an initiative taken by the CWDS in its first year of formation. Um, center comes up in um, around mid uh, 1980 and in September 1980 the center um, uh, got together and uh, uh, held a symposium which was focusing on the plan process to ensure that women's needs and expectations receive due representation within the sixth five-year plan. Why is this important? What I'm saying is that the movement is not just a reactive movement. The movement also has to pitch itself to change the ground so and intervene so that the ground begins to shift in favor of women. So the planning process, since the women's movement had intervened prior to independence in that document called the women's role in a planned economy, which I discussed in my uh, first lecture. What I'm saying is that here you have independent India and post CSWI women's organizations getting together. And for the first time you have, as a result of this, the sixth five-year plan has a chapter on women. That is the first plan in the, amongst the five-year plans in India where there is a chapter on women, which makes a commitment. And it did not happen so easily. I can tell you in that discussion and in writing, the CWDS files have letters where senior bureaucrats have said, oh, this women focus on women is going to destroy the family. These kind of arguments are written. So the secretary of a ministry is writing, saying we can't take this women approach, targeting women approach, because this is going to destroy the family. But the development imperatives, I can hold up the document which emerged from it. I mean, it's something like this. Uh, uh, woman of the 80s. Uh, it's a small booklet. It's a, uh, you know, it came out as uh, for efforts of the CWDS. What did it talk about? It said replacement of family and household approach with an explicit mention of women as a target group in, especially in poverty. Uh, eradication and poverty alleviation programs. It talked about a special component approach with earmarked resources which would go directly in the hands of women in terms of developmental interventions. It talked of a network of child care centers within the minimum needs program, expansion of training opportunities, maternal and child health, reducing male female gaps in literacy and elementary education, promoting values of sex equality, trained cadre in government and uh, enforcement of existing laws for the protection of women workers and women's access to legal remedies. Now, what I'm saying is that if you go today, you will find, you will hear about the group of feminist economists and uh, who are uh, working with the planning commission as long as it existed. Now, of course, it doesn't exist. You have the NITI-IO. But where did all these things arise? These arose, it was, arose with this gelling of academicians like Veena Mazumdar, Lotika Sarkar, uh, and others, of course, Neera Desai and uh, women in other centers. There's Ila Bhatt, 
um there's jayar nachalam there's people as well as political people politic because why i'm saying it is because there's a tendency to dismiss the politicians always but these were women like sushila gopalan geeta mukherji reenu chakravarti who use their uh, training and their exposure and their um the opportunity of being in parliament and being able to intervene in parliament uh, to push the dowry laws to amendments to push uh, schemes and uh, employment opportunities and laws for women that we need to understand and this gelling with the women's organizations and activity on the ground so this development imperatives i feel is and it was one of the first documents in the 1980s post emergency which is a joint document uh which was signed by AIWC and FIW YWC CWDS the Janwadi Mahila Samiti because AIDWA did not exist at that time the coordination committee of working women and the university women's association these are the i mean what i'm saying is these are humble beginnings we have to understand they also promote academic debate for instance on the question of dowry we know how much literature has come on dowry uh, in terms of its sociological roots its links with caste and debates there was for instance a debate i remember madhu kishwar wrote how dowry is a share it's a share in terms of women's inheritance and there was a debate rajni palriwala said how in fact dowry does not ensure any uh, inheritance or share to a daughter it's a debate and um, different positions came up but in all, in all these studies similarly on sati for instance on chabano uh, there were uh, these were issues which came up in the movement which took a lot of energy a huge amount of campaigning a huge amount of political uh, uh, sort of engagement because there are pal um, i mean on the question of sati after all uh, there was silence there was silence or there was complicity and you had a union minister in chandrashekar's cabinet who was co co uh, going around collecting funds in the name of sati dharm raksha samiti so there is a political engagement and we should not shy away from that political engagement but the good thing is that women studies also responded to these challenges and a lot of literature in every conference of the iws you would find a lot of papers by young researchers who are exploring both at the micro level and at the national level some of these issues for instance on the shahbana question the whole issue of muslim personal law there was of course tahir mehmood who was the most well known um, academician he used to teach law in delhi university who still remains one of the experts on muslim personal law but there was a lot of debate and i'll come to that again in the meantime what we find is that there's also you know society doesn't stop while you're talking about your rights and uh, women's rights and issues specifically what i'm trying to say is that every stage of the movement throws up new challenges new challenges in terms of developing perspectives on how to deal with it and how you frame your demands how you frame your demands then also leads to how you engage with others including official state government agencies the police the judiciary around these demands i mean uh, uh, i don't know if i mentioned last time for instance all during this there's a lot of discussion now on contempt case but you know there was a judgment the sudha goel judgment i think it was a case in dowry where the high court made a comment in passing saying oh dowry is part of our custom and we 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 protested against it do you know that all these organizations all of us had a contempt case and we were convicted of contempt of court for uh, opposing or criticizing that judgment and we held forth we fought it in the court and we said we have a point if courts if the high court of delhi sanctions and legitimizes customs such as dowry in the name of customary practice it then where will the women go for justice 
Similarly, on Sati, the same thing happened where I Court of uh, Rajasthan said Chunri Mahotsav is a right. And we said if glorification of Sati is a right, then where will the women go? So what I'm saying is there's a continuous engagement. So when we look at it in terms of methodological perspective, you know, our students tend to say, oh, let's see, is this liberal feminism? Is this radical feminism? Was this uh, constitution? What I'm saying is any social change and engagement with social practices, customs, when you try to usher in different kinds of approaches, there's a, an engagement across fields. What is interesting is that women's studies has responded in all these. Of course, the field does not remain the same. There is a field there, there's a political field. The 80s also saw a direct sort of, let us say, area of conflict emerging. Although it emerges, it has its roots in the politics of the day, and that continues till today. It has only increased uh, that uh, sphere of influence of what we would call uh, religion, religion in the domain of politics, religion as a mobilizational strategy, religious identity. Now these, uh, when we were engaging with these issues in the 1980s, these were coming up. It came up, as I said, on dowry, came up on sati very directly with uh, some people uh, asserting that sati was their custom, it was their practice, and they had a right to uh, observe sati and perform sati, etc. And uh, that uh, there was in a uh, law that Rajiv Gandhi tried to introduce in parliament, there was a concept of voluntary sati. Similarly, on the question of Shahbanu's judgment, uh, you know, her right to maintenance, again, there was, a, there was an open conflict. Uh, open conflict because whereas the women's organizations and women's movement said we uphold and we must uphold the right of, to maintenance of a divorced Muslim woman, the community and practitioners and leaders of the community came up and there were huge mobilizations which said that um, no, uh, um, uh, in Islam, there is no right to maintenance beyond the first three months, that is the period of Iddat. Uh, this is not uh, allowed for Muslim women. This goes against our community identity, our Sharia, against our personal laws, etc. The women's organizations were very clear. I remember we worked day and night for more than a year because I think the judgment, Chabano judgment, Chandrachur judgment came out in May 1985. And the bill, uh, which is the protection of women's, uh, Muslim women's right to uh, rights in divorce, whatever, the 1986 act that was passed on the 5th or 6th of May 1986. A whole year was spent in working amongst uh, women. And it also became clear that you had to work with Muslim women, because if Muslim women were not understanding your point, there was no point in your shrieking and uh, carrying your banners and uh, um, holding your meetings on platforms. So the organizations had to actually build linkages, work with Muslim women. The argument that the uh, big platform on Muslim women's rights in this period too, there was a difference of opinion. Some people said UCC, others said this, that, and the other. But I think the single most um, uh, valid uh, demand that came was from Edwa, which took it under also the commu uh, Committee for Protection of Muslim Women's Rights, which Zoya Hassan and many others were involved with, Seba and many, many people. And a lot of Muslim intellectuals, academicians joined in that. And there was a huge public campaign. I remember we submitted more than, more than 10,000 Muslim women's signatures on that issue. But how did we take it up? But the, our argument was that the right to maintenance that was given to Shabano under the Chandrachur judgment was not under Muslim personal law. It was under section 125 of the CRPC and criminal law in India 
till today, except for this aspect, which came in in 1986, is a secular law. It does not come under personal laws. So Shahbanu's maintenance was not given under Muslim personal law. It was given under Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code. And our argument was that criminal law is a secular domain. It does not clash with personal law. Section 125, you know, you will not believe it. At that time, the ceiling for maintenance was 500 rupees. Ceiling. No court could award more than 500 uh, rupees per month. And actually, Shabano was given, I think, a uh, um, maintenance uh, under the uh, judgment of some 172 rupees or something per month. And her lawyer husband was challenging that. Now, you can understand, because 125 is a law or a provision to deal with indigence, vag vagrancy, destitution, so that a woman is not out on the streets. So uh, that was the way it was taken up. However, we have to admit that you know there are uh, times when certain measures are taken. Uh, the women's movement, in a sense, uh, uh, to some extent failed that law was passed uh, uh, and uh, you will be surprised to know i mean you know how politics works and how politicians respond to very legitimate demands of women or concerns you will be surprised to know that the gates of babri masjid were opened in february 1986 uh, and the shabanu the law was introduced in parliament also in February. So, you know, politicians can deal with this in this manner. Okay, give to Muslims in one hand, give to Hindus in one hand. But that's not the way. And for the women's movement's experience is that you have to talk about um, equal rights for all women. And this uh, Shahabanu thing persisted. It has persisted till today. Till today, you know that the whole uh, triple talaq thing came up. Increasingly, what has happened is that the Muslim community, uh, whereas the women's movement strategy was that we should push for reform from within the community, even while also pushing for upholding and expansion of secular provisions in the law. But uh, Things are not in our hand always. And increasingly over these three decades, we have found that more and more this route uh, towards, you know, um, to uh, approaching communities from a political perspective has expanded. And it has led to increasing communalization of the discourse, it has in, we have seen increasing fundamentalism in the debates around whether it's triple talaq, whether it's uh, uh, criminal law, any of these aspects. Now, these are issues which, but the women's movement, I think from the 80s, we can say, there are two things which happened parallel, late 80s onwards, late 80s, uh, the issue of caste comes up in a big way, in a different manner. The issue of caste was always there in the um, uh, movement in terms of violence and sexual assault. It was also there in dowry in a different way. Sati also, the whole thing of the Shekhavatis and all. But from the 80s, as we see increasingly mobilizations around identity, we must understand identity is has many aspects. Today, when Dalits assert their identity, they are asserting it from a different perspective. But in terms of identity, politics within the political domain and its relationship vis-a-vis -vis women's rights, we have to understand that there is a lot of tension. Because very often, communities, particularly religious communities, assert a right to adhere to their beliefs, practices in the name of custom, her, uh, uh, tradition. And that often, if not always, comes in conflict with women's uh, definitions of women's rights and guarantees which are given in our constitution. Now, the women's movement's position throughout has increasingly been towards saying that we accept diversity and diversity must be respected. Diversity of custom must also be respected. But it 
should not be condoned to the point that that belief practice tradition or custom can be used to deny women equality which has been promised under the constitution of india and the whole debate which started with uniform civil code from colonial times finally came to a, a peak in the 1990s when for instance um, uh, a, a convention was held um, uh, which uh, asserted the whole point of what we call equal rights and equal laws this was a national level convention in 1995 uh, initiated again by edwa but uh, all women's organizations took part in it and an understanding was evolved there is still difference of opinion i'm not I, when i say all this this is not about um, saying that there is only one understanding also i do not want to say that only one organization or that only delhi worked because yes i come from delhi i speak a lot uh, uh, about experience from delhi but i think when i'm talking here i'm talking about national level women's organizations which worked in all the states almost all these organizations uh, had their branches or state units and they were mobilizing and they were reflecting concerns which were coming from all over more than that because this a uh, set of lectures is through um, documents i'm picking on documents which actually made an impact in terms of the discourse so this equal rights equal laws convention talked about personal laws it talked about hindu muslim christian tribal customary practices including boro marriage customs manipur uh, uh, customs in manipur adivasis in urissa covering the santhal the kharia the sauras etc and the whole question of polygamy specifically also from arunachal pradesh because you may know that in the late 80s from late 80s uh, in fact in the early 90s arunachal was going through a process where the chief minister was pushing for a law which recognized polygamy now polygamy is an issue which came up prior to independence it came up in the uh, towards equality report and here you had women from arunachal objecting saying this chief minister wants to justify polygamy you know and the strangest part is you would know that usually in the communal frames that we think we think polygamy is only an issue for muslims the actually polygamy is practiced and visible amongst other communities and here it was arunachal and also in this period you would have seen mary roy's case mary roy you may associate or may not she is arundhati's mother who had challenged christian personal law so what i'm saying is that the equal rights equal laws convention asserted that we are not about that the debate is not about uniformity of commit communities you know you want to say oh muslim women should have the same thing it should be equality of rights and also don't make it an electoral political issue don't uh, link it up with your politics um we uh, it said we oppose an unwritten patriarchal uniform code of economic exploitation social discrimination and violence we believe that um, there should be integration with progressive democratic and secular movements uh, and equal rights for women of all communities that the uniform civil code should not be used as a garb for imposing a hindu code on all religious minorities and the hindu code bill also needed reform uh, hsa 2005 was one of those uh, that under the proposition of a uniform civil code it to impose uniformity on a particular community in the name of national integration or national unity is not acceptable because we believe that it is not uniformity but equality which has to be the basis for national unity and integration the resolution uh, critiqued minority fundamentalism and the use of platform uh, 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 of minorities to pr promote fundamentalist understandings it also says 
that laws which are oppressive to women are defended by the fundamentalists as being sacrosanct but practices which are alien to the community and religion are never opposed by them what does it mean for instance no muslim organizations were talking about dowry which was infiltrating the muslim community but when it came to the whole question of shabano's maintenance of 172 rupees the cry was islam is in danger so what was what this convention argued was that we disagree with the position adopted by certain sections of secular forces which seek to downplay the positions taken by fundamentalists in minority communities on gender issues on the ground that it will weaken the main struggle while undoubtedly fundamentalism of the majority community is always more dangerous secular principles cannot be defended by compromising with fundamentalists in the minority community and in fact the con uh, convention and the resolution talked about other issues for instance desertion which is the and these are common to women of all communities desertion abandonment you will find there are platforms for um, uh, parityakta as they said it in maharashtra ekal women women who are just abandoned denial of property rights it raised the issue of joint matrimonial property uh, in the event of divorce uh, the uh, issue of registration and proof of marriage uh it spoke against dowry child marriage bigamy spoke against domestic violence and said that there is need for a democratic family code some of the slogans that it, the convention raised was not uniformity of male privilege but equality of all men and women break the present uniform code of patriarchy through e equal laws women are also part of the community so reform personal laws ban the use of religion for political purposes down with fundamentalism strengthen the bonds between the women's movement and other democratic movements etc and that is how uh, in that background the slogan for equal rights and equal laws was framed so this is one document which i feel it still has relevance we do not know we know that in the election manifesto of a major political party uniform civil code is very much there we do not know how it may come up we what i'm saying is as women studies scholars as activists as young women whose rights are involved we need to develop our understanding around these issues and look at the experience of the movement before we do it another issue which has affected women directly now a lot of people tend to think this is a political issue but the fact is that communal violence affects women directly and it is known from 1984 in delhi we know that uh, when communal riots happen um, violence against women happen just as when caste uh, attacks and atrocities take place uh women are uh, victims of sexual assault and women um, have seen this as i said in 1984 it was seen again in, from 1990 onwards and the whole aftermath of uh, the riots that we saw particularly in surat bhopal and amdabad after um, the babri masjid demolition i'm just uh, holding up a document which is here which uh, women's organizations uh, brought out uh, as a stud uh, from visits to riot affected uh, towns which is surat bhopal and amdabad after uh, in early 1993 since 90s we have seen an increase in um, and a hardening of positions vis-a-vis -vis communalism fundamentalism and of course on caste which i will come to shortly on communalism uh, if you look at the documents of the women's movement throughout india i think you will see this uh, there are continuous programs for communal harmony from 1987 88 we see a lot of it happening 90s is full of it any number of 8th march programs marches human chain around parliament in delhi etc and uh, then in 1993 
a memorandum was submitted to the president of India, which talked about peace and the uh, need to maintain communal harmony. I'm raising this because you will find some of these issues continue to be issues today. We have seen it closer home in 2020 in terms of the anti-CAA agitations. The issue is you may have a different position. You may have a position which upholds CAA. Others may not uphold CAA. The point is that there is need for debate, discussion, and all apprehensions should be addressed. And that is the political need rather than um, labeling a community or targeting a community and making the uh, atmosphere uh, more uh, vicious. And uh, the, the women's movement con has consistently from the time of 1984 riots in Delhi, we have seen and all across India has had a consistent position that we need to maintain uh, secularism, which is part of our constitution. We need to maintain peace and communal harmony. Now, there are two, three other issues which come up in this period. I will briefly talk about them uh, right through uh, the 90s. Um, actually, this, these uh, discussions also started in the area of health, for instance, women in health and reproductive rights. I'll just briefly talk about that because uh, this is running parallel right through. And it is running across the country. The Bombay groups have been some of the most active, whether it's Say Hearth or the Forum, et cetera. But uh, all organizations across India and in all the major centers have taken up these issues. I remember it was in July 1982 that I can record the first meeting on what we call the amniocentesis issue, which is the beginning of the controversy around sex determination tests in India. And CWDS and ADWA held a meeting in July 1982. The record exists in the CWDS's bulletin. And in that meeting, all women's organizations were present and a position was taken against the use of amniocentesis, which was a new technique in medicine against uh, its use as a sex selective practice. We remember uh, in 1982, around May or so, there's a journalist who used to be in uh, UNI, the agency, which is, um, I mean, our contemporary, who was a, we've known her as a student from JNU days, Ritambara. Ritambara Shastri traveled to Amritsar for some other work and personal reasons maybe, came back and filed a story which was flashed all across the news agencies saying that there are clinics in Punjab which are propagating, pay, spend 500 now to save 5,000 or five lakhs later, which meant abort the female child, do this test, abort the female child and save all the money and expense on dowry and marriage. And from 1982, we find, and it is, uh, as I said, late 80s, Maharashtra brought in the first law also. Uh, then, of course, we have the uh, Prenatal Diagnostics Test Act, then its amendment, the PCP and DT. And these are issues which had been flagged first by the Towards Equality Report, which I had talked of. That has remained an issue, and we, all, we are all familiar with the sex ratio. But I'm talking about documents here. Uh, there were other um, occasions. There were pregnancy tests announced. There were virginity tests, which the government of India undertook in certain conditions for passengers also. Um, but the major issue relates to population policies. Now, population was an issue which came up during the emergency when men were targeted. We need to know that after the emergency, men have never been targeted because I think the governments and all political parties learned their lesson that if you target men in terms of population, you go out of power. So after that, nobody has ever targeted men. 
but women's use as guinea pigs for trying all kinds of contraceptives has just gone on unchecked and with globalization and neoliberalism it has only increased this is also part of an international discourse on um, this whole thing of population you know it is the british who first said india's poverty is because of its population the fact that england's growth uh, you know historians have shown it bipin chandra and others there's a whole we call it a symposium debate in the indian economic and social history review from 19 65 or 69 i think i read it as a student in my ma days there's a whole symposium debate we call where the historians showed that actually england's uh, uh, population increase during the period of industrialization was higher than what it was for india but the host first world and us uh, agencies everyone has built this myth of this population bomb and that india's population is responsible for its poverty and now of course government says the poor are responsible for their poverty so this has gone on and the only concern that they have in the name of women's health is population control and all money that is spent successively women's organizations and movement have uh, critiqued this point that in the name of Uh, women's health the only money you are spending is on population control and in the worst possible ways so you have targets you have incentives and there are any number of reports which have critiqued that but in the 1990s unfortunately for us a whole committee which was set up on population policies and cwds has a small booklet which brings together a lot of these documents so does edwa so have other, i'm sure sehat and all in pune and awambe they have these pamphlets and since 1980s what did we see there was a push for norplant which was an injectable contraceptive there was a push for depoprovera uh, net n uh, then in the 90s came quinacrine and i think some 15 years ago you had the hpv vaccine now all these these are all ways and means of uh, sort of testing out and using indian women as guinea pigs with very serious health outcomes extremely serious health outcomes with only one objective that women should produce less children now the women's movement's position from the time of the wrp has been women have a right to decide and only they have the right to decide how many children when to have a child when not to have a child or not to have a child at all and Uh, the spacing or even contraception it should be informed choice however that has never been the case uh, but in 1994 i remember uh, there is this document which we call perspective from the women's movement on a national population policy i think it's an important document and all the subsequent uh, interventions by the women's movement around population policy saheli for instance was very active they even uh, took the matter to court and the hpv vaccine uh, i remember when was it about 10 years ago andhra for instance andhra pradesh uh, reported the women's organizations reported there were some i think how many women had died these and hpv and quinacrine always target young women so it's like 18 19 year old women who are targeted and then sama also took it up which is a reproductive uh, rights health collective um apart from the bombay group so what i'm saying is there is a huge area of activism and very important documents and of course there are then studies around it there are studies by what's her name um, indrani i think chakravarti there's of course jyotsna's book jyotsna gupta's book on reproductive technologies and sama has done a lot of work around this so uh, these are all documents and reports uh, it's also important what i'm trying to tell you through this is very often you know as academics we tend to look down upon very disdainfully on movement documents and we think oh they're all just propaganda but actually a lot of information is contained in these documents and uh, uh, if we are ignoring them we are ignoring them at our own peril uh, there are any number of issues i will keep 
two or three to the last and uh, I'll just come to those. I realize I haven't yet finished my first uh, lecture, <laughs> but anyway. Now I come to uh, one part. Uh, I'm sorry, there's going to be a bit of back and forth because of these two different lectures. Um, okay, from the 1990s, another um, issue which has been very, very important um, has been that of uh, political representation, 33%. On that, the document that I would refer you to is two sets of documents again. And these are all sets of documents. You can't say only one document, but sets of documents. So an important document is what we call the Gita Mukherjee Committee Report, which is a parliamentary standing committee report on the whole issue of women's representation and reservation, 33% reservation in parliament and legislatures, etc., which is uh, there from 1996. So I am uh, bringing it through the women's memorandum to the Gita Mukherjee committee report and the memorandum, um, uh, of, of course, the way the law was framed, there was a lot of debate and very healthy debate also. But at one point, the law um, in parliament, the debate reached a point where the idea was to derail the legislation. Otherwise, we would have had this legislation for nine, from 1996 onwards. Now, why is it important to look at it? I, when I first spoke to you about politics, I told you that right from the beginning, from the time of the freedom struggle, women's movement and women's organizations took the position that we do not accept and we do not ask for and we do not want reservation in the political bodies as women's reservation. So the question that comes to us is then what happened then? Why this shift? I also mentioned that see in CSWI in the Towards Equality Report, there is a note of dissent by Lothika Sarkar, Veena Mazumdar and Neera Dobra, who argued against the majority position. The majority position stuck to no reservations, but these three specifically said that the continuously low entry of and representation of women in independent India's parliament and legislatures is a matter of concern. And therefore, as a temporary measure, uh, reservation should be considered. Now, this demand comes up in a big way since the 1990s. Why does it come up and what is the background? We need to understand. The demand comes up in as a background because uh, in 93, you had the uh, 73, uh, 73rd and 74th Amendment, which brought in women reservation for women at in terms of local governance bodies, which is both the panchayats and in the urban municipal bodies. Now, the experience on the 73rd, 74th Amendment, which was finally implemented in 1994, was a very positive experience, despite the fact that there was all this discussion about punch parties and proxy politics, etc. But all studies showed that, in fact, participation of women, including from the most marginalized communities, Dalits, etc., had gone up, which also led to conflict and a targeting of Dalit women in the bodies. Uh, but that it was a positive experience. It was enhancing women's role and where women were involved in the um, uh, panchayats, uh, decisions with regard to spending uh, of money uh, uh, available to the panchayats, etc., was looking at certain more positive ways of um, expenditure and women's participation. Uh, and ultimately, we are talking about participatory democracy. Secondly, as I said, since the 90s, it, we are in a phase of identity politics. And when we're talking about gender, then this is one of, and uh, all of you who are coming from academics would have seen whether it's Neera Yuval Davis or uh, Anne Phillips, etc. The Anne Phillips whole work is around politics of identity, democracy, representation. And, uh, you know, this question, it's a complex question. It's not a simple question. Does getting women sitting in parliament, does it change everything? No, it does not. 
uh, will women perform better? We don't know unless they're there. How do we know? Uh, have in any case have men performed very well? If if seventy years of parliaments with so many men sitting there have reached us to this level of parliamentary democracy, then I mean why not? Why not have more women? In any case, if a democracy, if you have to widen the democratic base of India's decision making processes, uh, this. Uh, is a useful area. There were debates. The 1996 Gita Mukherjee Committee, that time also there were other issues. Some people said have reservation within political parties. And then the question was, oh, you'll put them up in the seats where you're going to lose, so it's not going to increase women's participation. Most important is that actually women do not have assets. Why do women not fight? A, there is, of course, patriarchy. Two, they do not have resources. Fighting an election in India today needs resources. So neither the poor can make it, nor can women make it, because women lack assets altogether. But if it is uh, a women only fight in a reserved constituency, then there is some scope. And Gita Mukherjee committee accepted certain things. They accepted one third of all seats in Lok Sabha and legislative assemblies for women quota within quota, meaning for SCs, STs, etc. The reserved seats would be rotated after each general election so that after a cycle of three elections, all constituencies would have been reserved at one point at least, and that the res reservation would be operational for 15 years. A similar bill was introduced in 96, 98, 99, all of which lapsed. The Joint Parliamentary Committee then uh, of this uh, thing, the, um, uh, some of the recommendations were included in the 2008 bill. Um, and finally, uh, the 2008 bill was passed in, uh, I mean, almost the same in 2010 in the Rajya Sabha. But it could not become law because it has never been passed in the Lok Sabha. So uh, some of these broad res uh, points were included um, in the 2008 bill. Um, uh, there is the main question was one OBC. That is how uh, in 1996 the debate in the Lok Sabha was derailed because people said OBC. Now the women's movement's question uh, position on that which is there in the memorandum to the Parliamentary Standing Committee, which is submitted on November 5th, 1996 for the 79th Amendment, uh, which was what the Gita Mukherjee Committee had looked at, was that, look, there is no OBC reservation in Parliament as of now or in any state government. There is no, there is SCST reservation and the women's movement not only accepts it, the women's movement believes that it should be there. But the OBC reservation, as such, there is none. And yet OBC men come in, a huge number of men come in, which means what? That the parties are not putting up OBC women. Instead of men, they can be putting up. And the women's movement's argument was that the day OBC reservation for OBCs is recognized by parliament, that day you bring it in, in terms of women's reservation. We have no uh, difference on that. But why should the women's reservation bill and 33% reservation for women be objected to by raising this issue of the OBCs? Now, as I said, you can have difference of opinion. But one point which everyone said right through was, you can have a debate, introduce it on the floor. Why has it not been brought into the Lok Sabha since 1996? It finally came to the Rajya Sabha. It also came to the Rajya Sabha because there was some other furor happening. There was a crisis. To crisis diffuse karna hai, so then you bring in the women's reservation bill. So it also tells you how politics in India operates. So this memorandum of the women's organizations, I think this joint memorandum is important and we should be familiar with the debates. One thing I will say, I personally, when I first heard about this demand, I have to say, and this demand came up in a big way just around the Beijing conference. 1995. What I want to say is when I first heard of this demand, frankly, I was not too enthused. I was not fired up with energy around it. 
But since the mid 90s till today, I have found that if you go to the villages, if you go to, amongst the women on the ground, I can tell you this bill and this whole issue has generated a lot of energy and we need to recognize it, which means that there is something in it. There is something in it, in any case, that is the position. And it is a matter of concern that how many parliaments we have seen and the number of women either just stagnates or sometimes it tends to go down. And therefore, this point needs to be uh, addressed. I think it is important. And this is one of the major documents which emerges from the movement. Now, I do not have too much time I'm going to do a little bit of back and forth and go to two, three points. Uh, two, three points together. Uh, one is, there is, you know, uh, it may appear as if the women's movement is working in isolation in India. In fact, there have been continuous international linkages from colonial times. From colonial times, women in India were interacting on international platforms, interacting with activists on international platforms and women's rights activists from UK, the US, from Germany, from Japan. Um, there was an Asian women's conference, I remember, in Lahore, I think in 1932. Indian women, when they were going to represent before the uh, official committee set up by Britain uh, and uh, the British government on suffrage, Indian women were participating uh, in those platforms, be it roundtable conference, etc., and also interacting with uh, women leaders of that time. Eleanor Rathbone is known. Her, uh, If you look at her papers in the Fawcett Library, there's a huge amount on uh, correspondence with women. Lady Rama Rao, for instance, spoke in an uh, international conference, apart from, I mean, way back, Madam Kama, who spoke at the Stuttgart conference uh, in the early 1900s. So there has been an international uh, con continuously. Kamla Devi Chattopadhyaya was in Japan where she was arrested, for instance, when, when she was also mobilizing both for national movement, freedom and women's rights. Now, what we find is that in, um, in India, in uh, independent India, also this dialogue continues. Uh, there is one document which I want to talk about for the simple reason that we tend to I mean, why is it important? I think it is important that the uh, women's movement in present times also recognize that there are larger, larger linkages, uh, not just through the UN platform, but movement-based linkages, movement-based solidarities that you build up, not just NGO. Because in the present day and age, we see a lot of international inter interaction, particularly South Asia, only through NGO platform. I'm talking about movement-linked, movement-based solidarities. And we have a long history of that. Uh, AIWC, of course, always had the mass organizations on the left have always had through WIDF, uh, the Women's International Democratic Forum, etc. But uh, even outside these groups, uh, I just uh, why I think it's important we understand why because it also places our own movement in a larger framework. Way back in 1981, for instance. Uh, CWDS initiated this. You may have heard of Nawal Sadawi. Nawal Sadawi was a well-known writer, Egyptian, and uh, she was also a medical doctor, a novelist, and uh, who wrote a lot around Arab women's problems and their struggles, etc. But Nawal Sadawi also took a position against female circumcision. Now, what I'm think, saying is, and why I'm talking about it, is we tend to think that, oh, we have uh, only our fundamentalists in our corner of the world. The point is there are fundamentalists in all communities, all communities. And in all communities, reform and rights of women are opposed by so-called leaders of the communities. Nawal Sadawi was vehemently attacked for taking a position against female circumcision. 
and you all would have heard of the whole issue of female circumcision. Now, what I'm saying is that we need to understand, you know, we tend to think only we have this problem. Now, there is a retrogressive assertion and a retrogressive perspective on women, women's rights, role, status being asserted across communities. Why is it important? Similarly, uh, for instance, you will be surprised to find that in the set of documents that you see in the CWDS files, for instance, there's a resolution of a meeting on women who spoke up against the Gulf War in February 1990. And they took a position saying that we are opposed to imperialism and imperialism uh, imposing war. And it is important that it was Iraq which was attacked and Bina Mazumdar took a very clear position that in fact Iraq which was being, you know, we tend to uh, see a homogeneously constructed, uh, very traditionalist uh, um, uh, image of uh, societies where, uh, which have uh, predominant Muslim communities. In fact, the history of Egypt, Turkey, Iraq, um, all even Iran prior to the 70s, uh, these are diverse histories. So why is it important? Because one, there is a pan-Islamic movement, you know, and a fundamentalist movement. Then we have our homegrown nationalists who want to construct a picture of the Muslim community and of Muslim women, which is so homogeneously and fundamentalistically sort of created and constructed that we think Islam is one big just thing. Now, what I'm saying is in the women's movement, we have always taken care not to be taken up by these images, imagery, or this rhetoric. We need to be realistic. And one of the interesting facts that comes out was that in fact in international forums and Bina Mazumdar talked about it regularly in interministerial meetings where women's issues were being discussed in fact Iraq took a very progressive position but Iraq had to be attacked because I mean and that is why I'm raising it here because in uh, the women's movement in India and the women's movement across the world has had two precepts which are central to it. One is a stand against imperialism. Two, a stand against fundamentalism. Three, a stand for peace, an active peace, not a pacifism, not a thing saying we don't, no, it's an active dead. Why? Because we believe that peace is important for women. Peace is important for development. That was also the slogan of the UN, the Commission on Women, equality, development, and peace. But from our own experience, we know that when a war takes place across the borders, who's, it's the families that are affected. It is women who are widowed. The War Widows Association in India, for instance, has always talked about peace on the borders. Why? Because they know that politicians will have their fights and battles and politicians on both sides will hike up the rhetoric and in the name of nationalism. But ultimately, it is human lives which are lost. It is peace which takes a beating. It is money which should be spent on development and developmental programs which goes to defense. Now, I'm no, I'm saying taking a position which is fraught with tension. Many of us amongst this group also may feel, no, this is national security. But there is a debate on what is security. There are human aspects to security. There are human aspects to development. There are human aspects to building nations. And does war and conflict, what does it bring to women? There is war and conflict and what it brings to women internally. And we know how uh, rape, violence, be it Manipur, be it Kashmir, be it any of the conflict-ridden areas, women are subjected to sexual violence. And the Verma committee took a position on it saying AFSPA cannot be used and it, the AFSPA should be reviewed if it is giving impunity to sexual violence against women. And women's organizations have continuously, I mean, we all know about the Manorma rape, that nude protest in Manipur against sexual attacks and assault on women. Now, what I'm saying is, 
you know, we have seen this in Sri Lanka. We saw it: civil, uh, rib, uh, civil strife, civil war. What does it bring to the warring Tamilian and Sinhalese communities? Finally, it was the women's organizations which initiated a dialogue across communities. What is more important is, you know, we don't sometimes realize what it means. Do you know that in Iraq, when the Gulf Wars was on and for many, many years, even pencils were not allowed for children? You know why? Because pencil has lead which was seen as graphite, which would be used for ammunition. Not only that, anesthesia was not allowed. So women who and, and men who underwent surgeries or abortions or pregnancies or any complications, no anesthesia was allowed. So what I'm saying is that the hype, hype around nationalism and conflict and war is one thing. But in the women's movement, there is a long history and we have those documents. We have those documents even from Beijing. And Beijing is important in its own way. Why is it important? Uh, and that brings me to what was supposed to be the lecture today, which was what happened to the women's movement in uh, the, at the turn of the century. And even though I'm using it as a slogan, but actually Beijing happened. And Beijing, I mean, I will, uh, I have, I'm never taken up too much by events. Beijing was an interesting exposure. We had a huge delegation from India, more than seven, 800 women, I think, from India, equal or higher number from Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, everyone. But I think what is important about Beijing is, of course, there is the Platform for Action, which is an international document. But Beijing uh, brought together and triggered, it generated a lot of energy. And I think since Beijing, the proliferation of organizations, platforms, networks working for women's rights, they have never looked back since then. Beijing also raised the issue of women's representation. The 33% issue came up around that time. Another issue which came up around that time was that who represents India? I remember I was asked a question that, look, OK, you're going to Beijing. How many Dalit women in your organization? Now, I'm not a believer in tokenism, but I think it is a genuine question. Who represents? Who represents the women of India in official delegations, in movement delegations, etc.? And it is from around this time that we see already the anti-Mandal agitation had raised the issue of caste from the OBC platform. There were divisions in the people's movement, there were divisions also in women's rights organizations to some extent, but by and large women's movement took the position that we are opposed to discrimination on the basis of caste. And it is uh, in 1996, I think then, we come to a platform, uh, 1997. Uh, but this discussion started in the 1990s around the issue of caste. It is not the first time. I want to say it very clearly because a charge is made that the women's movement never looked at caste, never looked at violence against Dalits, etc. I'll read out something to you which I wrote and I'm holding up this booklet because it's published in this booklet. It is a, a paper by, which was jointly written by Brinda Karat and me on violence against women, which was published in, ninth, uh, which was presented in 1992 in the IAWS. And I'll just read out two, three sentences from this paper on violence. It's extracts. It says the social construction of gender in India is closely interlinked with the process and of particular and specific problems of women belonging to an exploited class or women of the lower caste or a disability community. And these cannot be subsumed in uniform gender identity based on the premise that all women face equal oppression in a male dominated society. 
we said we move we have to move beyond the homogeneous character of gender identity which serves a purpose in terms of giving a particular focus to the women's movement but also covers up the specificity of oppression faced by women at different levels of existence in terms of their caste class and social economic background and this paper as i said was presented in iws in 1992 it represented an understanding it was a joint paper by brinda karat and me and then we talked more specifically in that paper later that of course rape is committed uh, on women but also in their being members of an exploited class which forces them into rape situations again and again the majority of these women belong to lower castes as they are designated or to tribals the overlapping to some extent of caste and class intensifies the vulnerability to violence the caste factor becomes particularly visible in atrocities committed on dalit women by upper caste men who are able to exploit casteist feelings among non dalit sections of the rural poor in their own favor against the victim I ask you to read this in the light of what is happening some 100, 120 kilometers from Delhi today. And anyone who says that the women's movement took a position of homogeneity and did not talk about caste, I would refer them to documents the protest against Arwa, the protest against Paraspika, the protest in 1988 on the Pararia gang rape incident in Bihar. And look at the judgments, those same kind of judgments which you see today. I mean, nobody destroyed anything in Ayodhya. Nobody uh, perpetrated uh, rape on this Hathras victim. Nobody perpetrated rape in Pararia. The judgments are there for all of us to see. How caste, class, ruling class politics. I'm not talking about parties. These are ruling classes. They keep their privileges and their solidarities intact, whichever government may be in power. These caste privileges also cut across much of this. But what we need to understand is that true, despite this understanding being there, and this understanding in our minds, I remember in the 80s, came from an an interest in rural society because for in the 1970s our issue was still rural society agriculture the agrarian classes and we knew that the weakest amongst them were the landless laborers and maithili shivraman had written about this way back in 1960s in epw she wrote she wrote in her uh, if her, you see her book collection um, on the Kilwen many uh, fi uh, firing and killing, where 42 people from the Dalit communities had lost their lives in an agrarian struggle. So it is a fact that caste was not a not non-issue, but caste was an issue in the context of rural society where conflict was particularly acute because the landless laborers were primarily Dalits and in all tenant landlord struggles and in all rural conflict, the Dalits and the castes which were socially uh, designated as the lower castes were directly attacked. This conflict has actually increased. This conflict has increased more so as agrarian society has deepened in crisis. And liberalization and globalization have increased that conflict. I've written about it in a volume that Manjit has edited, in fact, on globalization and its impact on women. But there is any number of amount. In Sri Lanka, what they said was that the in, violence against women was increasing as the peasant economies were being ruined. And that is the whole purpose of liberalization and these policies. You know, um, Latin American women were the first to protest against these policies, Mexico, et cetera. What had happened to their lives was not a joke. South Asian economy has been, you know, in a continuous spiral of agrarian crisis and civil strife in Sri Lanka. There are certain common problems. I mean, you know, if you go to whether it's Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, land, violence, uh, identity-based politics and uh, uh, spread of hatred and fundamentalist views uh, which 
uh, attack and come in conflict with women's rights. These are common. Instead of uh, identifying and addressing those common issues, instead we chose to fight each other. Okay, that's not in our hands. I mean, governments and nations will fight. That's what they are meant to do, I suppose. But we need to understand what identity politics does to our society. And we have seen, particularly since the 1990s, that as government spending in India on rural economy has reduced, uh, agriculture went into a spiral of a continuing and deep crisis, led to farmer suicides, all that is still continuing. We can see what the farmers are up against today, all that. But that's not the, the point is, Till the last census, the last census is when and now over the last few years, we are seeing a huge shift of women who are not finding work in rural society and there is a shift to urban economy, urban centers also. Otherwise, from the time Gail Ombet was writing that what 80 to 88% of women lived in rural India. So if the conflict was there, violence was there, it was there. But over from the, through the 80s and the early 90s, this has been happening in rural India. And in, if the vast majority, even till the last census, I think 67% of India's uh, women lived in rural India. The conflict is there. Urban sites are emerging today in different ways over the last, because now there is a process of urbanization. But for the women's movement, the a rural scene is equally important. Why am I talking about it? Because actually the roots of caste, caste conflict also are deeper there. Today, the caste conflict is emerging in our universities. We've seen that from Rohit Bemula times and in all campuses. But ultimately, the whole agenda of land reform, which the women's movement also embraced, which women, peasant women always embraced, why is it? Because the power of the landlord, the power of the upper caste landed communities directly is exercised over women's bodies. And that is why when we discuss rape, sexual violence, etc., and caste, we must also keep these multiple sites in place. As I said, since the 1990s, caste is a major issue, and I think it needs to be addressed, because if we ignore it, we ignore it at our own peril. It also means that we do not believe in justice. We do not believe in equality. If we think that caste privileges should continue and caste-based uh, discrimination and untouchability and the worst forms of denial of equality should continue, as I said, then we're only talking about gender equality in terms of our own privileges and our own rights. We don't mean business in terms of women's equality because women's equality is tied to the rights of women from the marginalized communities, more so today, uh, Dalits, tribals, minorities, uh, linguistic groups, Northeast, I mean, women in Kashmir, if we cannot envisage that our agenda for women's rights should include the democratic rights in all these multiple sites, then we are not talking about women's rights, then we are talking only about our rights from our location. I, I'm, I have no um, doubt on that. But in the movement, definitely we see from the mid-90s, the question of caste came up in a very big way. And I think it is an assertion uh, which needs to be recognized, not in terms of, oh, of course, it's there. But it has posed questions to the women's movement. It has posed questions saying, what do you mean when you say equality? What do you mean when you say women's rights? And I think the first uh, major assertion, apart from Maharashtra, which had seen a long history of social reform, which had seen Jyoti Bapule and all the Ambedkarite movements, and had seen these from colonial times. I mean, you would have seen um, uh, Vandana Sonalkar and uh, what's her name, Minakshi Moon's book, which is called uh, 
we also made history i think it's called it's a collection of documents uh, gail ombed wrote about it a lo long time ago and in the south from vi gita to everyone we have seen from the periyar movements to the no uh, temple entry movements the all those struggles in the south have been very powerful in the north anti caste movements have not been so powerful it's been mostly under the arya samaj which is not a radical radical movement you know like other anti caste movements but from the and uh, the caste uh, anti caste movements were also very uh, visible in the pre emergency period i remember i was a student and in my hostel in jnu we had women who were activists who had come from some of these movements and who had that consciousness and who would talk about these issues so these were there from uh, 1970s bihar also saw a lot of that but delhi north india much less so i would say but in 1997 the um, women's organizations uh, different women's organizations but they approached i remember we had a discussion in delhi where uh, the dalit uh, women's groups came forward and said that we would like there was a proposal which was not accepted in its full sense they proposed that in fact instead of 8 march 25th december should be seen as bhartiya sri mukti divas or sri mukti din and this first came up the mobilization happened i think in 1997 that is where we have the record uh, it uh, and what is the significance of 25th december it is uh the day when uh, ambedkar had sort of um, burnt the manusmriti and said we should give freedom to our mothers and sisters who are treated as slaves and also vis-a-vis -vis untouchability so uh, bahishkrit hitkarni sabha was held and all that the mahar satyagraha as we call it so that was the significance now since that year the dalit groups have definitely uh, observed uh, 25th december as uh, a very major uh, thing of bharatiya stri mukti and they have always approached other women's organizations um, you might find some material on this in an iws newsletter which is a special issue in december 2003 what i'm saying is that this is an issue which came up in the women's movement many of you would have read and seen uh, gopal guru's work sharmila rege the how dalit women speak differently the whole discussion on dalit feminism etc now we may have different positions on it that's uh, but there is no doubt the, and there is no denying and there is no running away from recognizing that the dalit question and the discrimination against dalit women and inequality that dalit women are subjected to both in urban india and in rural india is a key challenge to the women's movement in india and we, we cannot hope or even think of advancing the women's movement and women's rights agenda without addressing this issue i'll quickly move to another aspect which is linked to the caste question that is why i'm coming to it right here which is that of honor crime and here um, i would uh, point to a resolution uh, of a convention on 11th january 2004 against honor crime again organized by edwa but of course participated in and the resolution is adopted by all the organizations present which includes aiwc and fiw joint women's program etc it also pertains to something which directly relates to the lives of young women it directly relates to caste it relates to the question of autonomy aspirations and the freedom to choose it also links up with issues of sexuality which have come up in a very big way over the last 25 years i do not have time and i will cannot talk here uh, uh, because of time on article 377 but this resolution uh, in this convention uh, convention there were testimonies by victims and their families it says we uphold the basic human and democratic right of every adult to choose his or her partner 
it talked about consensual relationships and consensing adders and the right and that any be it caste panchayat or any caste leader or self proclaimed leader who upholds or acts and propagates anything which is contravention of constitutional rights guaranteed by our constitution should not be allowed to propagate so you may say you are a khap panchayat and you may claim i mean i am a student of history of punjab i have other evidence but these people who claim ki hamari to 500 saal se panchayat chal rahi hai you may have had a panchayat or not had that is a different issue but we live under the constitution of india and women have rights under the constitution of india and the constitutional rights must be upheld by all political parties by all panchayats and no consensual adult relationship can be criminalized or attacked and that was the whole thing and um, there was a whole issue of shelter homes uh, special protection homes uh, you would have heard haryana and all have manjula pradeep has done a study of some of those and a magisterial inquiry into deaths of all girls etc now what i want to say is usually the association that is drawn is that oh haryana mein ye hota hai the jats do it a student of ours in ambedkar university said the gujars do it now there is enough evidence we have had cases in maharashtra there are any number of cases in tamil nadu because what is the issue you know any marriage cutting across caste lines is not acceptable in haryana they say oh it's same goes fact is same goes marriages are very few actually it is inter caste and where it is a dalit boy who marries a non dalit girl there is a bigger problem in the village because as the leader of the khap panchayat told jagmati sangwan in a meeting where she went to discuss the matter with them directly they said you ask for property rights for women you mean to say we are going to allow these dalits to take away our land in jat dominated haryana are we going to allow dalit boys to in i mean girls who marry dalit boys to inherit land there's no question and you know that haryana assembly brought in at least on two earlier occasions laws which were, had to be stopped at the right Uh, level of president of assent president of india had we had to appeal to the president of india saying please do not give your assent saying uh, women in haryana cannot enjoy property rights they do not have a right to inheritance this is prior to hsa 2005 now we know there are ngos working in tamil nadu there is evidence and others there is uh, women's organizations working on the whole issue of honor crime etc there is pucl there is shakti vahini reports etc the question is what is the role of the state in all this what is the political will of the state uh from the 90s we saw when they used to catch hold of these couples they would hand over the girl to the family said deal with her meaning kill her do whatever you like and this is the police doing it and they would take the dalit boy into custody and deal with it you know what dealing with it means when it comes to the police so this is an issue and this is directly linked to the issue of caste and caste based inequalities and land relations let's not think that women's rights are outside these frameworks and that brings me to the last uh, question which i wanted to deal with and then to some larger linkages the last question that i wanted to deal with was that wrpe discussed women's work cswi towards equality discussed women's work where are we with women's work you would have if you follow any debates and data you would know that since 2006 7 i think if i'm not wrong all our data shows women's work participation rate is going down female work participation rate there are any number of papers by my colleagues neeta and indrani mazumdar etc on the cwds website which you can download and see what is happening to women's work all our reports on migration projects etc point to declining work participation rate initially academics economists did not recognize it they finally had to even the world bank recognized it and today even government of india there's ashwini desh pandey's work on um, uh, job loss including during lockdown now the point is how does the women's movement deal with it i talked about the first uh, memorandum 
which was I told you was this, which talked about economic resources, assets going directly to women and to women households, women headed households. What I'm saying is that the women's movement doesn't just respond to some incident that has happened. When you talk about an organized women and organized struggle, there are these organizations who are not just, you know, they're not just building political empires. They work. If, if you have any idea what it means for activists to go to the bastis day after day, work with women, bring, develop an understanding, it's no cushy job. And these are not paid. Most of them are not paid. They are not in jobs jobs. They are doing this voluntarily. And struggles are built over years, you know, an issue, you discuss an issue over years, how Ilabhat talked about self-employed, home-based from 1980s to now when you finally get laws or, or ILO conventions around home-based work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what I'm saying is, for instance, there was an, a major intervention which we don't even recognize. I've, of course, written about it in a book, um, in a paper in this book, Engendering Governance. Uh, I have a paper. The one major intervention and success, why I'm talking about this is because otherwise it is so depressing, but there are interventions which succeed sometimes. And one of the major interventions was when the Narega, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act was being brought in. They first said it will come to 150 backward or poor districts. Two women's organizations intervened. They appeared before the parliamentary committee, standing committee on, in rural development ministry on this employment guarantee act. One is ADWA, one is CWDS. And they talked about two, three things. One is definition of poor, as Brinda classically always quoted in those years, and she would say, what you have reduced women to is a struggle to be recognized as poor, because unless they are recognized as poor in your official records, they are not entitled to ration card, they're not entitled to food security, they're not entitled to any of your beneficiary schemes, they're not entitled to jobs. So this uh, so both CWDS and ADWA uh, notes and uh, representations before the parliamentary committee talked about a uh, women uh, and reservation for women uh, up to 40% that was brought in or at least one third and 40% was brought in. Why am I mentioning even during lockdown and during lockdown in fact very few women got because more men went back and got those jobs because Narega is not individual, it is household. The demand was for individual, for every adult, every adult, and also extending it to urban India, not just to rural India, also to extend it beyond the proposed 150 backward districts to all rural districts and all areas, and as said, urban. Also, um, the demand for creches was specifically raised in the ADWA memorandum because the uh, uh, provision when it was brought in said if there were 20 women. Now, there were never going to be 20 women on one side. So the ADWA memorandum said we don't accept this. Uh, it also said that where women or others also, they may be disabled people who may not be able to perform hard manual labor, there should be provision for other forms of work under Nareka. Now, what I'm saying is, these are some of the successful interventions. This was accepted by the UPA government. It was not in their plan. It was women's organizations intervention, which pushed for and got for a 40 percent reservation in the Narega Act as beneficiaries. Initially, they were not even making cards for uh, single uh, and women headed households. Even those struggles, the issue was also um, demanding minimum wages, meaning the payment should be at least uh, uh, as per minimum wages in those districts or in those states and special provisions for women. What I'm saying is the future is not always bleak. Just as on the question of violence, we saw we all we, we all of you would have gone through what we call the Nirbhaya struggle. Okay. Nirbhaya struggle did not happen in one day. The act that was passed in uh, 2013 
the um, uh, sexual assault amendment act that act women's organizations had gone to narsimha rao when he was prime minister in the early 90s saying look this is a draft you have to change the law on rape from mathura they went to the early 90s when they went with a draft that draft was continuously pending nirbhaya happened in december i have a memorandum from the women's organizations in september 9 2012 to salman khurshid who was the law minister at that time saying please amend the bill there was a draft the national commission for women had worked on that draft and that draft then provides you the ability to that when nirbhaya happens and there is so much furor rightly so you have a new amendment which comes in and you have the varma committee report which talked about the bill of rights which talked about women's right to life security bodily integrity it talked about democratic and civil rights equality and non discrimination right to secured spaces special protections and special protections for women in distress it said review afspa you can't say rape or sexual assault can ever be an act of national security it can never be even an enemy hostile woman does not deserve to be raped in the name of national unity or national security i mean we should be very clear about certain things my point is that in the women's movement there are different levels of activity activism academic approaches and building an understanding is one major terrain which are, and women studies centers are but in the background are organizations activists volunteers who have given their life to building an organizations building platforms building an understanding on issues you know uh, everyone you think that oh this is the terminology but 50 70 years have gone towards arriving at a consensual understanding towards that use of that terminology use of those vocabularies use of those um uh, what you see as given what you see as given in terms of police procedures when you say hatras why did they do not do this why did they do this these years and years and decades of struggle and work hard work have gone to. but all these are dependent on a prevailing commitment desire aspiration and upholding of democracy unfortunately for us the way our capitalist economy is moving today it doesn't see any need to adhere to rules i mean the newest labor codes are a big example they're going to deny all rights to labor all rights and women are part of the labor force or aspiring to be in the labor force so this labor force that they want to be a part of what are the rights they're going to have no rights these four labor codes that have been passed in the last it says we are moving towards organized industry but they are moving as my friend ravi shrivastava who's written on it also and neeta and indrani have written on it in epw in i think july you should read it that the labor codes are only going to institutionalize further precarity in the sphere of labor for men and for women now we have to understand that women struggles have to be advanced through negotiation of a democratic space within the project of nation building and if that project of nation building itself is fraught with tensions fraught with strife fraught with some kind of vocabulary which introduces gradations in citizenship which introduces gradations and distinctions between women and women between men and men between one religion and another between one caste and another and if the political will of the state and the state machinery after all the police force is part of the state machinery the judiciary is part of the uh, machinery through which and the institutional processes and platforms through which you struggle for justice and upholding women's rights my point is in an atmosphere in a political atmosphere which denies democracy which denies equality which upholds discriminations and forms of discriminations women's rights agendas are fraught with tension they are fraught with confrontation and conflict 
we have to be prepared for those because you think equality will come on a platter it never does not even gender parity even gender parity today it is clear whether it's shabri mala or that pune mat or haji ali or whatever even gender parity is fraught with conflict and if it is fraught with conflict on aspects of citizenship let us remember it is not only women of any one caste or community it is all women whose rights will be jeopardized i'm going to stop here because there's lots more but there's no way i can deal with it thank you manjeet and sorry for going on and on hello manjeet yeah yeah hello yeah okay well thank you so much you have actually covered such a big and a huge canvas i can't even really summarize it i mean <laughs> <laughs> well uh, and i'm 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 very sure there's more waiting in your papers i know that yeah <laughs> uh well uh, we have uh, one question which on more or less you've answered mm. so it talked about this saying that uh, what happens with, with these protests in fact the uh, what is the hatras case is almost the same as uh, mathura case because the upper caste upper caste are still dominating wherever so what uh, basically first is feeling dejected that the all these protests really doesn't lead to anything then nothing has changed because mathura case is is like mathura case what would happen if you did not protest is yeah, the question exactly. you have to ask yeah if you did not you see now at least you can hold the rule book and say look this is the rule how did you violate it who sanctioned it and what action you have to hold up the principle of accountability of the investigating machinery and accountability and speedy and certainty of justice to the victim dead or alive okay but just think that if all this had not happened for the last not only 50 70 years if those women in colonial india had not fought i mean where would we be think of that think of how we can even raise these questions today you look at your neighboring pakistan i mean those women keep fighting and every time they uh, fight is pushed back every time do you want that kind of civil strife as sri lanka saw for more than 20 years we have to avoid that because civil war civil rebellion civil strife and war between any communities any caste is only going to push back women's struggle that is what you have to and you have to act actively work towards a democratic india if we, i mean if women do not work towards building a democratic india forget about women's rights just forget it i'm telling you ghar jao baith jao baat hi mat karo it's after all these how many years women in tamil nadu andhra karnataka have fought against caste and you look at that even then i mean they'll follow two glass system in one place they built a wall i've just written a letter last month to nhrc you know they will not allow burial of certain dalit communities in their villages so in five districts there is no space for burial so where are the dead of those communities in this is a level of denial of human rights in our country and there is no way women will get their rights without those human rights being protected without those democratic rights being protected you know so you have to see these larger linkages and dalit women is not just in our universities are us gaon mein kya hoga socho those communities have to live in those villages and if you do not force the police and make it accountable for law and order much worse will happen much worse you just have to ensure that the law is implemented and every government whichever party every government has to implement that law about women about sexual assault about procedures the sops that are in place and the court should ensure justice if the courts also give up on ensuring justice forget it but the point is that the agenda for women's rights has to move with that of social justice if we think we can talk about only women's rights and gender parity gender in india and in all third world countries specifically is constructed within these larger body of social relations 
and therefore to fight and to advance rights on the basis of gender it you have to participate in ensuring that those rules those regimes move towards democratic social order if those hierarchies remain intact there's no democracy and if there's no democracy what are you talking about equality even men don't get equality in those contexts why will women get equality you tell me i don't see it happening well uh, one of the uh, speak uh, participant is asking for how do you get the booklets which you were showing they're all there in the cwds library i use the cwds library and whatever i have i give to the cwds library uh, sundaresh who's helping us with this has in fact scanned a lot of these documents for us so uh, and if you have any documents i mean for instance in the last years of her life rajni tilak was giving documents from the dalit women's movement and organizations to cwds which we said we would scan and share because that is the only way you have to build resources and um, at least cwds i know from the beginning as a uh, it has always committed its resources whatever resources it may have and the library um, seeks these kind of documents so those documents are there of course some of them are public documents these are printed documents for instance this one from which i read out um, my um, uh, that extract from brinda in my paper that's an edwa document and um, edwa bulletins for instance equality and even their online bulletin will always have any memorandum that is given in that period that is one thing we ensured from the late 80s that whatever memorandum or document comes out from the women's movement that should be published in nfiw bulletin will also have aiwc will have a lot of those documents from earlier on but um, and airwc has given a lot of its documents uh, to nehru memorial library apart from them being in their own library airwc has a good library his for historical documents that's good uh, delhi's documents the delhi archives i'm told i have visited it long ago but now i'm told a lot of it is digitized delhi archives the delhi state archives for instance i mean uh, in delhi state archives you will see a document how 8th march was observed in the 1940s you know saheli samaj or saheli sabha in jamia they organized a meeting i think in 1942 or something around okay art march international women's day so there's a lot available so that we don't go looking for it and our great partho chatterjee the great academician he wrote you will never find documents in the archives because women's life is lived in the personal domain unfortunately women's life has never been lived in the personal domain it is out there in the field as you can see a disastrously so in the hathras incident i mean where is the private in women's lives and in colonial india no way in present day india i mean third world countries are different from first world countries you know well there is another question hmm. why the caste based crimes and sexual violence are not being acknowledged by the present party leaders they not being acknowledged i think they are they are being acknowledged if you wouldn't have all that happen on the borders for the last week or 10 days and not only that i mean in tamil nadu for instance that kilven many uh, firing and those killings which i mentioned mathli shivraman wrote about it i think in 1969 or something she wrote about it in epw she wrote about it in probably whatever newspaper of the day um and it was because there was a struggle going on between the kisan sabha and the landlords it was a land caste based struggle the fact is in rural india caste based struggles is are linked to land struggles and that is how we saw it in our mind i'm saying it that we saw caste it's wrong to say we did not see caste but we saw it as linked to land in urban india it has come up in a different way and i think the dalit women's movement has raised it and pushed it and pushed the women's movement to acknowledge it that is important but i can tell you that the earliest protests i sat on against sexual violence were almost all of dalit women or tribal but almost all were dalit women 
so it's not as if parties don't write but if the parties there if their social base is linked to the upper caste then why will they so it's, it's not a question of putting all parties in one basket i mean after all parties have different social bases if it's a party of traders upper caste why would it fight for dalits right they're not fighting for their right anyway but if it is a party which believes in mobilizing the uh, agriculture the rural poor the agricultural laborers there's no way they will not talk about caste they, they cannot exist without talking about caste they won't survive in any district of india if they do not talk about caste the whole issue is which side are you on which side are you on are you on the side of upper caste don i mean you may come from an upper caste after all we don't choose the caste we are born into we are all born but do we represent and do we uh, are we a part of organizations which represent and uphold upper caste privilege dominance power they are in power you have to understand they control your resources they control land resources they control capitalist resources and ruling governments all governments will listen to them after all that's the you know that's what they have seen to be there for by those ruling classes i mean you must understand behind parties there are ruling classes and those ruling classes tolerate only those parties in power which will uphold their interests okay there is a negotiation after all these governments have to be democratically elected so they'll also negotiate that look we can't go so brazen but there are times these are brazen times i mean um, uh, what we always say is that there are phases of capitalism when monopoly capitalism says dispense with democracy it's not needed because we can't afford it we need more super profits that's the history of capitalism that's how we study the history of capitalism in history mm -hmm. i'm still waiting for any more questions in case people have please write questions in fact professor indu has stopped in between because she had many more many more things to share so that you don't miss your questions in case you have any questions please write i think they are exhausted it's been a very long session for them also yeah but it was so interesting to find that actually from one to the other there are so many issues which and the the struggle behind actually makes it so interesting for the person who is not into the struggle that how actually it came up for example we talked about dowry and with the dowry in fact so many things got changed oh, and uh, yeah so these that's these, where I, yeah that's why i got that memorandum even though nobody is talking about that memorandum but i thought some things which you think today or oh, they are these are given but i mean the mem and i was part of the drafting committee of that memorandum with veena de and rami chabra and the uh, rani jethmalani and kirti was there so we were all uh, i mean you know it stays in your mind how you thought of those things 30 years ago 35 years ago it's a, it was a struggle everyone didn't agree everyone didn't agree i know pramila dandwate and some of us disagreed on family courts we said family courts will only push reconciliation uh, so we were saying special courts or you know but uh, pramila and therefore in the memorandum family courts went in because she took a very clear position on it and we've seen that family courts can be pushed towards reconciliation there's mixed experience there's mixed experience so you learn and you negotiate most important is you learn to listen to others learn to understand their point of view and say okay we disagree but let's move together none of us want dowry so let us move on down so that's uh, even for the rape if there's so much of a struggle has gone in between the rape for yeah. rape yeah. and still i mean uh, negotiating with the with the issue and there's still time and again we are facing this absolutely yes i see i mean uh, my study with honor killing in fact i I've, I've, I've in case i'm just waiting in case people want to write more questions Uh, in, in the uh, near merit with outskirts of the merit we went to an interview a person who was actually 
in the uh, in the hospital and then after the some relative of hers took her away mm -hmm. so that because she had married a uh, sc and mm -hmm. they filled the sc and she was uh, in the hospital and she was carrying and uh, he, and then none of the family members came to see her in the hospital or look after her because mm -hmm. the government hospital many more things many hospital many medicine and all has to be provided from outside Hospitals are not that equipped. Yeah. SHO, local SHO kept doing that, and we met the SHO and we wanted to meet that girl. And he said, Try, they have shifted her to take her to another relative's home. You go and try. So he fixed up a meeting with another an SHO in that area. So we took another policeman with us to go and visit that person. It was so horrifying that it was so silent. We just couldn't, we kept requesting that we are we are academicians, we are coming from university, we are no politicians, we are nobody, we just want to interview her to beat her. No, she's not here. She's not here. After some time, the environment was so silent that the policeman, in fact, gave us a gave us a, a, a tinkle that you must leave now because otherwise they, it can be a problem. So mm. without without talking to anybody, we have to leave. We had to leave the state the place. Mm. Yeah. It was so horrifying. You just cannot meet anybody or the honorary in case the uh, in case the relatives don't want to. Yeah. 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 And we were told that she's being, uh, she has been, uh, got aborted the baby and she's not being remarried. But there's another question. Delhi Commission for Women, it has been, it has been doing very well, but what problem I saw in the whole structure was that the commission only have the power to recommend. Thus they need to have, need brave leader, chairpersons to present them. NCW clearly has been doing totally the opposite of what it should have been doing since the new chairperson has been appointed. What can be done to the to make the institute more powerful? Well, uh, on the state commissions as well as on the national commission, let us understand there are two levels of problems. One is about the people who are appointed. Very often, uh, you get a uh, what we call the commissions are used as parking lots. Even the NCWs use as a parking lot that a ruling party has a, a woman member who they don't know, they can't make her a minister, they can't give her any other position. So put me down the NCW. This is, we have opposed it. I mean, whoever, whichever, of course they will come from the ruling party, that's the party in power, whichever. But don't use it as a parking lot for your political women leaders bring women who will bring some sensitivity and experience and commitment to the job uh, that is why you will find uh, that when there are women with who are dynamic and who have that commitment they bring that whichever party may be in power you will find if there is a woman who's committed who's dynamic who understands her role and her job she will bring that to it Secondly, there is a problem in terms of its constitution, and we had raised it when it came up. You see, uh, very few of you will know, but Subhashni Ali was a member of the National Commission in the, I think, the first time it was set up or whatever. And you know, she resigned because she said the commission has no power. She said you have, and this had been raised by women's organizations when the NCW was being set up because a whole national convention, I didn't have time and I don't have that much space. Otherwise I would have read out from the memorandum that women's organizations gave when the NCW was being set up because we agitated for that commission to be set up. We wanted it to have powers. It, if you do not give it the statutory powers that the SCST commission had, even you know, even NHRC has powers to recommend. Now, re when I spoke to the NCW chairperson, I remember some years ago, she said, what can I do though? The state government doesn't even, when we send them reminders, they don't even respond. They don't have budgets. I remember the National Commission for Women organized a gathering with all their state commission members once at uh, Constitution Club. And I spoke, to, I addressed them also. And when I was interacting, some of the state com women's commissions have a budget of 3000 rupees for year for the whole year what you tell me what can you do in 3000 rupees you can't even take a taxi from one district to another to go and visit and see when an atrocity happened so they you know some are for bihar for instance for many years they didn't even appoint 
they didn't appoint any women then finally manju singh was appointed you had to give memoranda in every state thing appoint a women's commission then you have to say appoint the right kind of people now it is not about persons but we all know that persons bring their own dynamism and energy that is a fact also there is a political will thirdly as i said there is the law if you if you bring a toothless commission it will work like despite that as i think if i read your chat you know uh, i think at one point for instance delhi commission delhi commission has a lot of data on cases and if that were to be analyzed it would tell us a lot about conditions that women live under in delhi and individual leaders individual chairpersons i mean we've seen it i don't want to take any names i could about ncw and about uh, the state commission the fact is individual leaders women bring dynamism and energy and some amount of commitment that's needed without that sorry in any case the law is weak not only is the law weak they have undermined it the women's organizations protested when the ncw was uh, undermined and what happens is that the uh, member secretary or whatever uh, who's appointed who's an ias officer ias officer is responsible to her cadre so she thinks you know um, in fact in a meeting i remember vina mazumdar said it openly and i have said it to mary robinson when she came visiting and we had a meeting in uh, the ncw i said the fact is national commission for women was set up as a watchdog body on the government but the government of india successive governments have turned the ncw and all such commissions into their departments or outposts of their department the the, the role they are supposed to play is to they they are supposed to see what violation the state and agencies are doing but if you treat yourself as a department and the your power and your salary and your privileges are dependent on the government's good will then you will never take a position against it it's a weakness in the act itself for many of our commissions that is the problem but even within that framework individuals can do a lot i'm telling you they can do a lot and delhi commission of women um, on rape sexual assault violence they have huge amount of data over i think more than 20 years more than 20 years if somebody they should you know for instance uh, your uh, wsdc manjit you should enter into a collaboration and get a grant and analyze that data it's huge data on violence that tcw has and that they have done good work also you know they have had good lawyers with them who have uh, guided and counseled and given legal advice uh, which is useful but they, they go up and down so suddenly you'll get a good person at the helm who then pushes and then it goes down that happens to a lot of our uh, institutions but there is a flaw in the act and when once you see a um, once you see a, a, a an a commission being undermined to the position of where that it is answerable to the government there will never be a watchdog body on flouting of rules and laws by the government i mean you look at what is going to happen to hathras where every rule in the book has been violated but who's going to look at it well there there are no more questions they have had enough they had enough i think we <laughs> need lots to think about the the, the yeah. thing we shared and there's not for them to really assimilate and then think about as other questions are maybe they'll come back to you in in, in, in individually yeah. thank you manjit for this opportunity and if you have a recording make it available to me so that i can uh, go over it and see what all i missed out <laughs> on you know recording yeah, definitely we have the recording and we'll put this recording on the website the website and uh, recording will be there i will definitely share that it has been a pleasure to have you professor professor indu in fact the kind of mine of information you are i know for many many years and that's the reason i was waiting when you will actually say yes to these series of lectures 
you had mentioned this to me uh, maybe a year ago that you were interested to talk about something on how methodologically how women's movement should be looked at. So I was keeping that in mind and we had the one, the, the, I mean, a casual talk and you said, yes, we, by August, maybe we'll be able to talk about it. And that is how in effect it, uh, it materialized. So I'm glad we could do it. And uh, thanks to technology, it actually helped to at last to finish the last lecture. And uh, um, in fact, it, has been, it is actually opens up windows for people in case you want to do something on women's movement. It actually is opening up windows for you to see and after actually see the archives how and where to get the material. So anybody a student of women's studies and who wants to work on women's movement is a great, great uh, opportunity to listen to her. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. And thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Manjit. And thank you, everyone, for being so patient and getting, providing me this opportunity. Of course, as I had said earlier, I would have wanted to, this to be done in a workshop mode. Maybe if people are interested, we should explore it another time, another opportunity when it can be done where you read the documents and you make presentations and you develop your understanding. You pick and choose themes, pick and choose the documents and read those documents and give us a reading of those documents and your understanding as it were. That was how that idea had actually come up. And I, I stuck to it as documents. So this is not a history of the movement, but is, is a reading of the movement through documents from the movement. That is how I see this exercise. Thank you, Manji. Yeah, let's see in case in off mode, when we can do something in off mode. Only when the corona goes away that we <laughs> think about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And special thanks to CWDS and Sundaresh for giving us the technical support. Thank, Thank you, Sundaresh, from me also. Your being there is always reassuring. Yeah, it is great, great reassurance for me, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay.